Hi, my name is Ying Gao and welcome to Dr. Gao's classroom. I'm a professional philosopher and I love classical Chinese poetry. I have been translating and teaching classical Chinese poetry for the last few years. I would love to share my knowledge on the subject with you. Your enjoyment is my command. Today, I'm going to continue my theory on poetry for romantic love. I'll introduce a new poet who is known for composing epic romantic poems, such as Chang Heng Ge, or The Ballad of Eternal Regret, or Pi Pa Xing, or The Ballad of Pi Pa. Both poems are celebrated as literature masterpieces for over a thousand years. These two epic poems are so famous, even today, people still citing from these two poems to describe a scene or an emotion. For instance, people often use Bi Yi Niao or paired up lovebirds or Lian Li Zhi or trace with jointed root to describe a loving couple. Bi Yi Niao is a pair of mythical lovebirds. Each of the birds only have one eye and one wing. They have to pair up to see and fly. Lian Li Zi are two trees where their roots join together. Both imageries symbolize two people with the deepest love for each other, so much so that it is not possible to separate them without killing both of them. These two imageries are used as the concluding couplets in the poem Chang Heng Ge or the Ballad of Eternal Regret. 在天愿为比一鸟,在地愿为连理之 Meaning, in the sky we would like to be the lovebirds with paired wings. On earth, we would like to be the two trees twined together. The name of this great poet is Bai Ji Yi. Bai Ji Yi was the most popular Chinese poet, not in China, but in Japan during his lifetime. From 640 to 838 AD, 12 Japanese delegates were sent to the Tang Empire to study the Tang culture, politics, and other skills. Some Japanese scholars even stayed to sit for the National Civil Service Examination, passed them, and were appointed as official at the Tang court. The best known Tang official from Japan was Abei Zhongmari, or Abei no Nakamaru, who was also known as Chao Heng in Chinese. Abei no Nakamaru was a close friend of the great Tang poet Wang Wei. I have made three videos about Wang Wei's life and poetry. Here is the link. Abe was also a close friend of the great Tang poet Li Bai. When Li Bai heard the false news that Abe died on his voyage back to Japan, Li Bai was so devastated that he composed a poem to mourn him in the title of Ku Chao Qing Heng or Weeping for My Friend Chao Heng. I have made many videos about this great poet. Here's the link to the playlist. Anyway, I would certainly make some videos about Abe no Nakamaru, his friendship with Li Bai and Wang Wei, and his poetry in the future. Now, back to Bai Ji Yi. His poem was first introduced to Japan by the retaining Japanese diplomats in 838 AD and was an immediate hit among the Japanese scholars. The then Japanese ruler, Emperor Saga, a contemporary of Bai Ji Yi, was the biggest fan of Bai Ji Yi's poetry. Emperor Saga not only had Bai Ji Yi's collection of poems by his pillow to read every day, but also recommended Bai's poems to all his officials. 
He even created a teaching position to appoint a scholar specialized in Chinese poetry to teach himself and all the princes Bai Ji's poetry. Back in the Tang Empire, Bai Ji enjoyed a name as both a great poet and a loyal friend for another poet named Yuan Zhen. Yuan Zhen and Bai Ji Yi were best friends for life. They exchanged hundreds of poems with each other and dedicated many of them to each other. They were often mentioned together as Yuan Bai and their poems published together. I have made a video about Yuan Zhen. Yuan Zhen was one of the earliest novelists in Chinese history. He might be a heartless womanizer, but he was definitely a loyal friend for Bai Ji Yi. Here is the link of my video on Yuan Zhen. I might make some video about Bai Ji Yi's and Yuan Zhen's friendship and their poems for each other in the future. Let me know in the comment section if you would like me talking about their poems for each other. If you are new to my channel, please check out my other videos on classical Chinese poetry, philosophies, or medical literature. If you like the content of these videos, please click the like button and subscribe my channel. I also offer one-to-one -one online lessons on these subjects. If you would like to read the original text with me, please contact me. Here's my email address. Now. Let me first talk about Bai Ji's background. He was born into a scholar official family in 772 AD in Henan province. His father, Bai Ji Geng, was a rank 4 official at Da Li Shi Shao Qing, or the equivalent of a judge at the Supreme Court. Like Wang Wei, Bai Ji Yi was a child prodigy. He first made his name in poetry at the tender age of 14 by composing a text poem in a trial exercise for civil service examination. The title of the poem is Fu De Gu Yuan Chao Sheng Bie, or On the Request of Composing a Poem for Seeing Someone Off on an Ascent Grassy Plain. Now, let me show you a beautiful calligraphic work for this poem and read it in Chinese first. Li Li Yuan Shang Chao Yi Shui Yi Ku Rong Ye Huo Shao Bu Jin Chun Feng Chui Yo Sheng Yuan Feng Qing Gu Dao Qing Chui Jie Huang Cheng Yo Song Wang Shun Qi 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 Man Die Qing now, let me explain the first two couplets. Li Li Yuan Shang Chao Yi Shui Yi Ku Rong Ye Huo Shao Bu Jin Chun Feng Chui Yo Sheng Li initially refers to a ferocious demon in the mountain as shown in its earliest character where the character of sun or mountain is on the top followed by the character of Xiong or ferocious, and the bottom of Hu or tiger. It looks like this. However, when it is used in pair as in here, Li Li, it somehow acquires the meaning of flash. Yuan means plain, Shang means upon, Chao means grass, Yi means one. Shui means year, Yi again means one, Ku means feather, Rong means grow. Note there is a format of Yi something and Yi again. It is often used to describe something that repeat in a rhythmic manner, such as Yi Dong Yi Jing, or now it is active, then it is quiet. Yi yin, yi yang. Now it is yin, then it is yang again. Or yi xin, yi yi. Or focusing one's heart and mind exclusively on something. 
Here it is used to describe the phenomenon of the grass that thrives and then withers again and again each year. 野火 means wildfire. 烧 means 本. 无 means not. 近 means off. 春 means spring. 风 means wind. 吹 means blow. 又 means again. 生 means the life. So the four lines read, Last, last, the grass upon the plain, that each year withers and then grow again. Not even a wildfire can kill it off. When spring wind blows, it springs to life once more. 远方清古道,晴翠皆荒城. 又送王孙去,气气满别情。远 means distant. 方 means fragrance. 清 means invade. 古 means ancient. 道 means road or highway. 晴 means fine. 翠 means emerald. 街 means rose up. 荒 means abandoned. 城 literally means war, as in the case of 长城, or the Great War. Here it refers to a world fortress. So my colleague and I translate it as fortress. 又 means again. 宋 means see off. 王孙 means prince. 去 means go. Qi refers to the luxuriant grass. However, it can also be used as qi, meaning sad or desolate. Given that the poet was seeing of his friend, qi here might have the double meaning of both the luxuriant grass as well as being sad to see his friend off. Very clever. Man means full of. 别 means parting, 情 means thought. So the four lines read, Distant fragrance invades the ancient roads. Fine emerald rose up to the abandoned fortress. Seeing of a departing prince again, these souls of parting are luxuriantly full. The poem starts by painting a last grassy plain. The poet marvels about how resilient the grass are. Even the wildfire could not destroy it, and it comes to life again when the spring wind blows. In the second part of the poem, the poet continues to praise the strength of the grass and the wildflowers. It is wonderful how the character Qi is used here. Just by this one character, we can imagine how aggressive the wild grass and the flowers were by taking over the Asian highways. Due to the size of the Chinese empire, almost all dynasties took their communications between the capital and the frontier extremely seriously. As I mentioned in my other videos, that most dynasties had a rather efficient state-run postage services, such as Huanyi, or the official transportation system, where free accommodation and horses were provided for the traveling officials, or even the scholars who travels to the capital to sit for the national civil service examination. If there were a war at the frontier, the postage service system were also used as the military communication and transportation channels between the capital and the frontier. So the highways were usually maintained quite well. Here it is clear that this highway was almost abandoned because it was almost taken over by the grass and the wild flowers. Not only the Asian highway was taken over by the grass and wildflowers, the world fortress was also taken over by the grass and wildflowers. We can see 
through the eyes of the poet that in a beautiful clear day, the bright emerald color of the grass runs right up to the abandoned waterfall trees. With the character of Qing and Chui, it is quite easy to imagine the scene, the fragrance of the wild flowers, the emerald color of the grass. These imageries present the vibrant colors and show the aggressive force of life. Yet, these vibrant imageries are in stark contrast to the abandoned waterfall trees and the half-buried ancient highways. All these represent the mixed emotions of the young poet. He was sad because his friend set off for a long journey and they might never see each other again. And their friendship might end up like the abandoned fortress or the forgotten ancient highway. However, they were still very young, full of life. And he wishes that their friendship would also be like the thriving grass and the wild flowers. Once the situation becomes favorable, it would come back to life again. And nothing can destroy it. What a wonderful poem to dedicate to a friend. This poem is not only extraordinary that it expresses complicated emotions elegantly, but also in its simple language that it can be grasped by anyone. The beauty of the poem was quickly recognized by other scholar officials at the capital. In 787, the 15 years old Bai Ji Yi arrived at the capital Chang'an. He paid a visit to a well-known scholar official and a poet, Gu Kuang, to present his poems and essays. Gu Kuang saw that his name was Ji Yi, which literally means make a living easily, and made fun of Bai's name by saying, Chang'an mi gui ji da bu yi, meaning the rice at the Chang'an is expensive. Make a living here is not that easy. Then he read Bai Ji Yi's poem and said, Well, if you can compose poems like this, it should be easy to make a living here. We do not know much what Bai Ji Yi did in the following 10 years. However, we learned from his poems that he fell in love with a girl from his neighborhood at the age of 19. He pleaded many times to his mother to marry this girl, but his mother refused, arguing that her family's social status was too low to match the Bai family, and he should marry someone with a higher social status. Maybe this was the reason Bai Ji Yi would not sit for the civil service examination, because if he passed the exam and was appointed as an official, that would only increase the gap between his social status and that of his girlfriend. We are not sure about this. What we do know is that Bai Ji Yi did not sit for the National Civil Service Examination until 800 AD when he was 28. And he was still not married at the age of 28. This was quite late by the Tang standard. So in my next video, I'm going to tell Bai Ji Yi's love story and two poems he composed for his girlfriend. If you're new to my channel, please check out my other videos on classical Chinese poetry, philosophies, and medical literature. If you like the content of these videos, please click the like button and subscribe my channel. I also offer one-to-one -one online lessons on these subjects. If you would like to read the original text with me, please contact me. Here is my email address. Thanks for watching my video and I'll see you next time.